Um, we're trying something new this year. Um, how many of you have the Bible app on your phone or whatever device you have? Okay, I emailed this morning. We actually, my notes are on there, and we're going to try to do that every week. So you can follow along on that. There should be a live event, something about Catalyst or Romans or something along those lines. So if you want to know what I'm going to say next, theoretically, uh, you can open that up and take a peek. We are going through Romans this semester, um, and that's going to be super exciting. There's a lot that we're not going to get to cover. There's a lot of stuff that's going to have some additional questions, and I want to encourage you guys to, if you're taking notes, if you have your, your app on your phone, you can take notes on there, and then you can come right up to me or Shandy or Nathaniel or whoever's speaking that night and ask those questions. If you think something we said isn't accurate or want to know why we came to that conclusion, come talk to us. Uh, and we'd be happy to discuss more. Come sit down in the office. As long as there's coffee involved, I will be happy to talk to you as long as you need. Tonight, we're getting started in Romans 1, 18 through 32. So open up to that or slide your phone up to that. And I'm actually going to read that passage now, and then we'll, we'll talk about it for a little bit. Romans 1, 18 through 32. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in their lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations with those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So what are we talking about? That's one of those passages that can strike a chord on a lot of people, either personally, a close friend, a family member, something along those lines. Um, and what we're talking about is the gospel. And I think despite most commentary saying you can't really sum up the book of Romans in one word or phrase or idea or concept because it's so, so deep, so like widespreading, I think you really can sum it up as such. It is the gospel. It is a theological discourse from God through Paul to explain the gospel in its entirety. We just, we have in the Bible just before this, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts. The church gets started, and then here Paul is kind of laying it out. Here's what the church is. And in order for us to understand the completeness of the gospel, we have to understand that God's wrath, the bad news, is just as important a part of this as understanding his righteousness, which is the good news. This means that much to our dismay at times, we have to truthfully look at his word. We have to look at the whole truth. We can't just pick and choose. Have you ever, any of you ever dyed your hair? Raise your hand. Philip has. Okay. Have you ever forgotten to put gloves on when you dyed your hair? Okay. How many of you have ever helped your wife dye her hair? and thought gloves are silly and you don't need them. Have you, Jacob? What would your hands look like afterwards? The purple. Nice. Nice. Amy went dark brown once, and so did my hands. Okay, now to catch maybe a different side of the room, maybe the same side of the room. How many of you have ever hunted an animal and killed it? Okay. Have you ever gutted said animal? All right. This is the graphic part, like hands up in there ripping junk out. Okay, now, close your eyes. Those hunters in here, close your eyes. Go ahead and save at the moment with a smile. And remember what your hand smelled like for the next couple of days. There it is. And then fast forward to dinner. Everything is better. Everything is better. 
we're privileged to have God's right. It, it applies. Hang on. We're privileged to have God's righteousness revealed in nature. God's righteousness stains everything around us. Okay, you shouldn't be able to come before God in your daily routine. You shouldn't be able to worship God without getting that on you. So when I dyed Amy's hair, people knew I did something. They could tell by my hands and the edges of her head. When you, when you gut a deer and you go to someone, they can tell you did something because you smell. That you have blood stains, your pants are covered. You shouldn't be able to go to God without getting stained, in a good way, with, with all that he is, with his righteousness. And that's where we are today. This passage that we read has some tough stuff. Some statements that can really conflict us or divide us. These verses can catch us. It's easy to point fingers But then our dark secrets start coming forward. Our flaws begin to surface. And when we read the whole passage, we start seeing that our fingers are actually pointing at ourselves as much as anyone else. The people receiving the letter from Paul here, this is is the letter to the Romans. So Rome was big on their idols. They had statues. I mean, the emperors, they, they were the gods themselves. And everyone had to worship them. They were busy putting each other up, or themselves up, as of primary importance. And the key here isn't that we sin, what I want to talk about is how we get to that point of sinning. And the answer is in verse 23. If you look there in Romans 1, 23, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. It says that the people, and if you stop now and think of your own life, you can probably put yourself there, exchange, the people exchange the worship of God, the creator, or worship of what we've made God to look like in our lives. We've morphed and changed God into what fits us, into what feels good. We've changed God from who he really is into this alternative reality that we make up, into what we want God to be, how we want God to fit into our lives. We pick and choose what bits we want of God in our lives. How many of you have food allergies? Not just me. Food allergies are stupid. All right, I was fine. I could eat whatever I wanted and did. Uh, And then my daughter had some food issues, and so we cut dairy out. And then my wife and my other daughter and my son had some allergies with wheat and gluten. Thus ended my life. So we cut those out. I do have some dairy now. I am recovering dairy. But but then it gets worse. So my wife then uh, cut grains from her diet, which not just gluten, there goes like corn and rice and all the other wonderful things that God created. But it kept going. So then, um, actually, Katie Kaczmarek was with me when I discovered I was allergic to nuts. Uh, We were on the way back from a retreat, and I was driving, and my hands started swelling, and I didn't know why. So the next morning, I went and got a shot before I started talking like this. And then... Just over the summer, I developed an allergy to nightshades, which is like tomatoes and white potatoes and peppers. So literally, think to yourself, what's left? (laughs) That's not even real. That's like physics. It's not real. But let's just say you have a recipe you're doing, and there are 10 ingredients in this recipe, okay? And I'll imagine I'm cooking because I like to cook, and it works well because Amy likes to eat and not cook, and I like to cook and can't eat anything. So 10 ingredients in this recipe, and it looks delicious, and ingredient number seven hidden in the list is, let's say, tomatoes, because what that does is make my whole like eye area swell, and it looks ridiculous, um, and it won't kill me, so I can laugh about that. So these ingredients, and I can, I can do this. I can make this. I can slip some tomatoes in there, and no one will know. No one will see me slip it in. No one will be able to tell that there's tomatoes in this recipe. I'll make this delicious, whatever the crap it is with 10 ingredients and tomatoes, And I will eat it. And I can sit there in front of people and eat it, and no one will know. And it's okay that I enjoy that, because that's my decision. But the thing is, within 24 hours, you'll know that I enjoy that. Or you'll know when Jimmy John's forgot that I said no tomatoes. Because I'll have this giant swelling thing. Is it all right to have that little indulgence? That one little ingredient, that one little thing, It doesn't hurt anybody else, but it hurts me. It harms me. 
and that hurts my ability to do what I'm called to do. And you guys are smart people, so you can see what I'm getting at here. When we go through life and there's this one little thing that we are not supposed to do, this one little act that we, we are forbidden. You saw what happened to Adam and Eve. But there's this one thing. It's fine as long as no one sees us do that, right? It's fine if we shift gears and focus on ourselves a little bit because we deserve that. If we just kind of put God aside because, you know what, he's there, is, was, always will be, so we can come back to that and take care of me for once. It's okay to take care of the creation rather than the creator once in a while, right? And satisfy my desire right then. Because talking about these foods, I really want a chocolate cake. There's an interesting cycle in this passage here. When you exchange the truth for a lie, or a partial truth, or a shadow of the truth, you, you've tried to mold into what is comfortable for you, into what you feel like. When you worship yourself, when you worship the creature rather than the creator, when you let your priorities get askew, God lets you. That's your choice. God will let you make bad decisions all day long. When you sin, and here in verse 26 and 27 it says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. The passage speaks here directly against homosexuality, but more specifically, again, you're putting creature above creator in that scenario. And the issue is your pursuit of what you want in that moment. When you decide to dishonor yourselves by satisfying that pursuit, God lets you. When you cut and paste the scriptures and pick and choose the content that you want in your lives that day, what fits into what you want to do, what you're into, what you're interested in, what your craving is at that moment, when you stop acknowledging God, when you neglect the whole of the gospel, the good and the bad together, and put yourself or another person in that primary position, God will let you. We can look and we can see in this passage and throughout the Bible that God is creator and that he is justified in his judgment of us. Remember that. God is just in his judgment of us. It's easy to slip. It's easy to get distracted by life and, and to find myself in the wrong place, doing the wrong thing. We have to remain diligent. I need help. I need accountability. I need someone keeping an eye on me because I'm not the smartest cookie in the box. There's a story to illustrate that aside from my bad grammar. So I was doing some work in my house. Uh, we had done some minor home remodeling, which resulted in essentially gutting the entire basement. Uh, and I was putting it back together, and I was tired, and I am not a carpenter. I am not a drywall putter-upper, and I am very much not an electrician. But on this particular night, I was putting up drywall, and I had cut the outlet hole in the wrong spot. So naturally, I moved the outlet. It was easier. And so I, I unscrewed the outlet, and I thought to myself, you know what, I've already had the power off and on. It's dark. I'm not turning the power off again. I'll just move it. No big deal. I'm still standing here. So I did this, and I was very careful. You know, there's the, like, the plastic little blue box you can move and like take it out and put it back. And then I had to squeeze the outlet. I got the box all reattached where the hole was. It lined up perfectly. I had to take the outlet and pull it out of the box to squeeze the drywall over it, put it back in there, and then the last two screws to attach it. If you've ever done electric work, I grabbed the outlet like this. For those of you who don't know, that's where the power comes in. And when you connect those with your fingers, you feel it everywhere. And so Amy's standing next to me, not paying attention, and suddenly I'm like, Dzz. I let go after a couple of seconds. But I, I do stupid things. And I want you to know that up front. It's a silly example. But we need people to keep an eye on us because we can be so focused on doing the right thing, so focused on, on ignoring Satan's calling into our life, so focused on following God, so focused on not touching those 22 little screws on the side, and we get distracted, and suddenly we're like, Zzz. and it hurts a lot more than you think it would. But in our lives, we get distracted by those temptations. We get distracted by that one little moment. And it messes us up. It's easy to slip and get distracted. 
we have to keep ourselves focused on the whole of the gospel, both the good parts and the bad parts. I need you guys to help me stay accountable. You guys need each other. Hopefully, for at least a little while longer, you need me for something. Sin is bad. I can, I can read the Bible with you. We can sit and do Bible studies all day long. We can see what God says is wrong for us. Uh, here, the main line is that we have and often do give up the truth for a lie and worship the creature rather than the creator. I love you guys, and no matter what you're doing, I love you. God loves you, no matter where you go, no matter what you pursue. He loves you so much that he's willing to let you walk away. He's willing to let you make those mistakes. He's willing to let you go and look for something better. God knows because he's God. When you choose something over him, God lets you. That's how much he loves you. God does not withdraw his love no matter what you go after, no matter what you pursue, no matter how long you block him out and ignore him. He does not withdraw his grace, and he does not withdraw that salvation that he's offered you through his son. I said earlier that God is justified in his judgment of us. Sometimes we try to justify ourselves. We ignore that one ingredient that we know what's bad for us and we have problems. We choose which bit of the Bible we want to pay attention to today. We try to justify ourselves and we just can't justify ourselves without God. When we step away from God and from his word, we can't justify ourselves. What in your life are you choosing before God? What actions or thoughts are you trying to justify that you know isn't the right action, isn't the right lifestyle, isn't the right thing for you? What are you overlooking in the lives of your family and friends? Are you ch- trying to justify your life based on the, the person sitting next to you right now or in class or, or some other time that you're not as bad as that person or if this person's doing it, it should be okay? Are you trying to justify yourself based on what feels best to you in the moment or are you putting yourself up against the gospel? against Jesus? Are you measuring yourself against what you are called to by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? By the God who's referred to in in Amos 5.8, I thought was a really great verse to exemplify this. He who made the Pleiades and Orion, who turns the blackness into dawn and darkens day into night, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out over the face of the land. The Lord is his name. And that's just one little verse that you can read others in the Bible. You can imagine if you look around, the beginning of our passage said that God is revealed to us in nature. You can't not be stained by God's righteousness, by God's glory, if you just look around. My goal each day is to get up and do better than I did yesterday. No matter what I did yesterday, I'm going to be better today, to be a better dad, to yell at my kids less, which after yesterday was easy to do today, to be a better husband be a better minister, to be a better child of God, because that, as scripture says, is what I am, and that's what you are as well. You are a child of the living God. I try each day to love people better. Some of you make that difficult, but I try. I try to think more about God first. I try not to be angry at situations that are out of my control, and I try just to relax and let God lead me I try every day to pray more passionately. I try and I try and I try and I can't succeed without you guys. I can't succeed without God. I can't succeed if I don't focus on the whole of the gospel. The list goes on. And my friends, I pray that you will keep the whole gospel. Focus on it. Study it. The good, the bad. Keep the creator above the creation. Keep Jesus as your measuring stick. Justify your actions your thoughts, and your way of life based on Jesus Christ, based on the guidance of the Holy Spirit, based on the scriptures, and not on yourself or any other human being. Regardless of where you are in life, the kind of mess you are in, how awesome you're doing in your faith, God does not withdraw his love from you. The old phrase, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. How many of you heard that from your parents on a regular basis? That is exemplified in Jesus Christ. God is justified in his judgment of our failures, but he also justifies you through his son. Tonight, the worship team is going to come back up. We're going to sing a couple more songs, and consider that. Think about that. Pray about that. Think about the gospel as a whole in your life, the good, the bad. How does that affect your decisions each day? There's a prayer box in the back. 
there's people all around you that are willing and eager, even if you don't know them. We're all here because we're Christians or we're interested in being Christians or you thought this was like a calc exam. Either way, we'll pray for you. So if you need to have time to pray, if you need to talk to God tonight, if you need to make a decision, if you need to repent from something, if you need to confess something, if you just need to sit on your knees and cry because God is convicting you of your life, if you need to just go to God and thank him for what's going on, whatever you need, let's do that now together as we stand and sing. Pray with me as you stand. God, I pray that you would just give us the strength, God. Help us to see the gospel as a whole. Help us to focus on you. Help us to know the good and the bad and to know that no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, no matter what we've done, no matter what we think we're doing, God, that you will never stop loving us, God. I pray that we would have the strength to pursue you and set aside our worship of your creation and instead worship you as creator, God. I thank you so much for your love. I thank you for the sacrifice of your son, and I pray you would just be with us tonight as we worship you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.